professional who has significantly shaped the HR landscape. Welcome. Back. So thank you everyone and uh, I must say on this lovely morning it's my privilege to be here with all of you today. We are a esteemed institution of course R&D Management, R&D Institute of Management is a very well reputed institution and also given the connect with R&D it makes it all the more successful. So, uh, of course, you heard about my credentials. I would also like to mention here that I have a deep connect with the army institution, not only because there are people in the family who are a part of the army, but also because uh, when I did that two year stint as professor at a B school in Mumbai, one of my responsibilities was also to develop management education uh, courses for uh, Indian Navy. So that was INS Hamda in Mumbai. And I have trained and coached uh, officers both from Navy, Army, and uh, Air Force, not only from India, but from friendly neighboring countries as well. So that's the connect. So anyway, I was coming in here and I saw the overall look and feel of the place. I just couldn't resist myself from taking a picture with all of that because it felt so noble, it felt so grand. So thank you for inviting me here today. So before I start off, can I understand a bit about the profiles of uh, all of you assembled here today? So when it comes to students, what are the profiles like? Are all of you from first year? How many of you are from first year? Your pants, majority. So which means uh, your specialized courses have not yet started. Right, you are studying general management right now, and hence the topic of artificial intelligence is more like an enigma, probably. That what is it all about? The whole corporate world is talking about it. So I'm also assuming that by now, till now, you are not really aware of all the intricacies of, let's say, marketing or HR or any other function. Intricacies you wouldn't be aware of. Okay. Second year students, how many? Okay, and you have uh, different specializations, I believe. HR, how many? Okay, marketing. Okay. Oh, you have dual specialization, right? This is why the same hand could uh, go up for a second time. So the specializations are HR, marketing, I heard business analytics is also a specialization. Uh, great, so I have now known my audience to some extent and later. So I wanted this to be an interactive session. So of course I have a deck which has lots of slides, uh, but um, uh, even during the course of the discussion, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Some questions were sent to me last night and uh, when I was going through them, I saw that you know I have covered, I will probably be covering quite a bit of it automatically in the course of the session. But uh, do feel free to ask even in the meantime. Okay. So, um, how many of you are really, really interested to know what artificial intelligence is? Or is it because the professors have told you here is one dignitary coming from Bobbing, attendance is mandatory, you have to be in the auditorium, you have no way of escape. So, the Friday night morning is gone and you are here. So, what's the truth? How many of you are really, really interested to know? <laughs> Did I even have to ask this question? <laughs> Rhetoric, probably. Great. So, uh, as you know, artificial intelligence has taken the world by storm. Let's see how, why, and what lies ahead. I think the IT team can uh, display the deck. 
So, uh, the topic that was given to me, and of course, I would, I would venture that uh, I'm fine with any topic as such. And what came to me was, can AI replace humans? Right. So, I did not put the same topic here. I want to give it a twist to say when um, artificial intelligence meets human intelligence. So that's where magic happens. Right? So that's what we are going to see today. So for sure, there is a huge uh, uh, potential here, which even the government of India is trying to tap. The number of AI jobs have gone up a lot. So if you just do a bit of study about the jobs that you would see in Monster and Opry.com, let's say 10 years, 15 years back, and you see those jobs now, you will see so many different roles like analytics, AI, all of it is kind of flooding the job portals, right? What has brought about this evolution? Next. So I will give you a bit of a background as to how I got interested in this. So there was a news uh, sometime back, a few years back, that uh, uh, Sophia has got citizenship in the Middle East. And I was like, you know, who's this Sophia? So it's Sophia the humanoid. Have you heard of her? Yeah. And then I heard that Sophia has come to Bombay as a speaker uh, at one of the IIT events. And then in 2018 at World Economic Forum, which happened in Bombay, I learned that Sophia is a speaker there as well. And I kind of grabbed, I kind of grabbed that opportunity to go meet her in that forum. And there she was, a robot, which was, you know, speaking just like any other speaker. But there was a difference. And there was someone here. So the name of the company is Hansen Robotics. So an executive from that company was also standing there and was kind of monitoring and directing her. So of course, the very novelty of it, the exotic nature of that speaker, that was like a wow factor in everybody's minds. But I also noted that Sophia and her speaking prowess is incomplete in the absence of that one human being who was standing there and directing and controlling her. Right? So that was one thing I realized. Then I delved deeper into it and I went to this place where Sophia has been introduced in Hansen Robotics. And if you see that it clearly says that all this AI is wonderful, but it's important to know that no AI is nearly as smart as human. Uh, therefore, many of my thoughts are actually built with a little help from my human friends. So basically, this is a robot created by humans and which took the world by storm. So where does a robot with artificial intelligence help us? Where does artificial intelligence or machine learning So I'm aware of this data. Every second, we are bombarded with 11 million pieces of information. Every second, in this one second, I mean, this is what I can fathom, the, the intelligence that is going inside my brain right now, and then there is so much more. So 11 million pieces of information every second. And do you know what our brain can process? Our brain can process only 40 of those in one second. So that means that we are constantly doing something which is um, a bit of implicit biased decisions. Because my brain is choosing, right, how much of the information from all this to process. So that's where there is this concept of unconscious bias coming in, right? And this is where artificial intelligence can help to create a world, to create a society this is very neutral because it will it will help us look into what we look into and that what is not colored by the cultural uh, uh, religion or any other lens that we wear at times. 
That's where machine learning helps us. Thanks. So there was a question yesterday that where does, if, if there is so much of artificial intelligence happening, where does it, um, how does the interplay happen between ethics? What are the ethical considerations? So since the time, uh, let me ask this, what happened on November 20, 2020? Any guess? Claudio? Okay, so let me share this uh, with you. So AI has been there for ages. There are functions in organizations which are talking about it, working on it. But on 30th November 2022, uh, OpenAI launched ChatGPT to public. So once generative AI came into the picture, the world was no longer the same. Within seven days, subscriber strength grew. And Facebook, Spotify, LinkedIn, none of them had been able to achieve that kind of subscription within one week's time. And then it kept on growing, it kept on growing. And right now, you know the madness that is going on, right? Technology has reached a different level altogether. And of course, along with technology, the different kinds of hardware that come into being, which is why you would have seen that entire saga of Sam Altman's ouster. And then enjoying Microsoft and then it being restated, reinstated. So obviously, when it comes to technology and uh, power and all of that, so there's it's, it's follows a cyclical pattern, and, and they go hand in hand. If one comes, the other cannot be left far behind. So where ethical considerations are extremely important. Uh, so if you if you look up on uh, uh, Google or any other uh, search portal, you will see. That there are companies which have lost billions because of their uh, lack of ability to kind of predict the right kind of data. Because when generative AI came into the picture, uh, people experimented with it big time. Have any of you used generative AI in your presentations, uh, etc.? So you have, right? So now when you do it, you have there is a lot of opportunity to absorb the failure because you are learning, right? We, we learn by experimentation. But when corporates do that, when they use that data without the right filters and checks, and when the output is incorrect, that has a huge, huge uh, uh, fallout. So that is something that corporates must be aware of, that we can all use AI, but if it is not used in the right way, it can actually lead to a lot of issues and company have actually uh, spent billions in lawsuits because uh, you can't have errors in predicting there's a right time or things like that you know things which are of utmost important and are time sensitive so what is FAT? this is a framework that is used to determine uh, artificial intelligence related ethical considerations so FAT stands for fairness uh, accountability and transparency. So you would realize one thing that AI as such will not take accountability for anything. It will do what it is best suited to do, which is it will provide an answer. At least let me talk about chat GPT, it will provide answers to the questions that you have asked, right? But who is responsible for ensuring that those answers are accurate answers? I'll give you one example that I made. So I was trying to figure out um, what would be the uh, specific requirements in a solid line and dotted line relationship. Are you aware of these terms? Not really. I haven't been so deep into it. So let me explain. So um, I'm explaining because there are HR students here. So in corporates, when it comes to different kinds of functions, we have different reporting mechanisms. One is, of course, a solid line reporting, which means my manager who is in charge of my appraisers, my overall worker activity, etc. Dotted line is someone, uh, a manager who doesn't have a direct control on the employee, but mainly because there is a project-specific thing, they are in charge at that point in time. For example, even in college, in your college examples, uh, you sometimes have these cultural fests or different kinds of events, right? 
And when events happen, you will see that naturally some group gets formed. There are some natural leaders who kind of, you know, try to uh, put the groups together. There are people who rally around them and behind them and make things successful. So for that particular event, probably there is one person who's calling the shots and others are helping. But the moment that work is done, then everybody is respected. So temporarily when there is someone who is in charge of another person as a manager, that's then you use it as the metrics reporting thing. So I asked to be the response to this, that what are the expectations from a certain client manager and a lot of client manager may be the answers. But in order to take that answer to my target audience, I am the one who has to do a lot of tweaks to ensure that it is palatable and it goes out in the right format. So there are these examples that come up these days. ChatGPT has been asked some questions and responses. Sometimes a bit disrespectful, sometimes it's alluding to uh, some area which is very sensitive. So these are all checks and balances which the user of the AI framework has to do. So there could be lots of uh, uh, there could be lots of issues around data privacy in general because artificial intelligence is pulling data from the whole universe. Now, in that, what is it that is acceptable and what is not. So like in my organization, we have rolled out these sessions for employees where we are telling them how to use AI responsibly. Any mistake made by the employee in accessing and publishing data could actually be very costly for us. So there's a framework which guides the which actually guides the uh, entire framework. Sorry for this morning campaign. Only people who are addicted will learn. Yeah. Is there an audio issue? Okay. Yeah, that's yes, right. So now coming to the area of HR, especially because there are so many of you from this field, from this fraternity. So uh, what is it that AI is able to do for us? I see reducing bias, right? Now, is there an example that you can think of? Where can AI help in HR? Any response from the group? I know the initial response always takes a little bit of time. And when one person shows the way in opening up, others follow. Yeah. Shortlisting of CVs. Yes, that's certainly one area. So when a human shortlists a CV versus AI shortlist, what's the difference? So let's look at that. Now, just before that, because he brought up the topic of recruitment, let me share this. So, uh, and, and the reason why I'm sharing these snippets is because I look at these kinds of sessions as basically not sharing sessions. So you should go out of the session with at least some two, three prominent takeaways, things which you did not know before, you know, so that's how I bring up all these research elements. So let me bring one up here. So this experiment happened at Stanford University. It's a very famous one, and it will help you understand the merit of AI. So two sets, I mean, one CV was given to two sets of people. So let's say these are two sets of people. This set um, has the CV of uh, so the CV is of a uh, private equity uh, person, you know, venture capitalist, a very smart executive uh, working there uh, in US. So this group has the CV of someone called Howard. This other group has the same CV, exactly same, only the name has been changed from Howard to ID. Both the groups are given time. You know, so these are the social experiments which happen. All of you who are interested in analytics, you will, uh, you know, experience this yourself. How we design experiments and research experiments and social studies and how we derive analytics out of it. So, CV of power, CV of height. They are given time to go through the CV. After some time, it asks, it's asked to both the groups, what do you think about the CV? So, all those people who had the CV of Howard, 
they said that um, well uh, seems to be a go getter very target oriented achievement oriented person and it looks like team members learn a lot from him i think i would be keen to be a part of our team right? this is what the verdict of the group was then the other group so they said uh, very strong cv looks like someone who has achieved a lot accomplished a lot could be a bit bossy in nature could be a little um, authoritative perhaps um very driven maybe too driven at times tough taskmaster i'm not too sure if i want to be a part of her team do you understand the beauty of the experiment now same cv just because the name has changed from a male to female there is so much of a difference in perception this is what we call unconscious bias implicit bias this is how our brain decides why because our brain in, in every maybe most societal structures probably is wired to think in a certain way that if a man can be target oriented achievement oriented established go getter it's a very done thing if the woman has exactly the same qualities it may not be very done thing so basically likability and success they don't go hand in hand for a woman i'm not making the statement at all i would like to believe i'm like but uh, this is what research suggests right so what happens so this is what happens when human beings have done the cv analysis and when artificial intelligence does it when cvs are shortlisted you will see that these biases don't why because it is only going in by the data you are feeding in if you are looking for someone who is achievement oriented go getter um uh, very good at his work very capable basically you are just looking for skills right skills are different from the personality of the skill holder so you put the skills there you get the output like that but in this case this this experiment had proven that unconscious biases exist in society in life in corporates this is where ai can be of great use right so this is what it does so improved recruitment not only happens in terms of bias but also because out of a plethora of cvs you know so there are times when people say that i have written to hr of a company and not got any response you know so of course hr should respond and acknowledge the cvs but just to be fair to those uh, people as well if you look at the number of applications that come in for one single job people can go bad so then what happens is ai is able to filter out those cvs which are actually of use and not that that's your overall uh, universe you can still pick out from it and do your own shortlisting but ai saves you a lot of time at least then you are not going through those plethora of cvs and trying to scan what is in there or not right so that's one big benefit for sure uh in terms of uh, recruitment there are other benefits as well so shortlisting of cvs becomes easy putting in keywords and doing the right searches become easy sometimes not only for the purpose of final onboarding but you may want to know that let me see the power of my branding let's say this institute wants to put a ai tool and find out what is the percentage or what's the number of meritorious population let's say people who have had 90% plus in their lives throughout if the institute wants to know that out of so many applications that i get what would be the percentage of population who are 90% plus a human being can also do that without a doubt that we have all done that also in the past which is going through the stacks of cvs creating an excel database putting it all down and then uh, you know doing the tally we can do all of that but just look at the time saved when there is a tool in place so that's what ai does on the improved recruitment front so i'll just pause here for a bit any thoughts from the group at this stage as to you know the power and potential of ai any 
Maybe not immediately. Okay, let me move on to the next Better prediction models. So I see that a lot of you are from a business analytics background. Um, let's say somebody tells you 100 people left the company, right? What would you think? It's a huge, huge issue. But what should your question be? That 100 people out of what staff strength? Somebody tells you there were 200 people and 100 left. 50% attrition, huge, right? We all understand this simple math. Then someone tells you that actually 100 people left out of 10,000, right? 10%. The magnitude of seriousness seems to come down. Then somebody tells you 100 people left out of 1 million people. Will you bother about that problem? You will not. Your brain will know if I have 10 different priorities to attend to, this is not my priority because this is not a problem. This is an absolutely pers uh, uh, negligible percentage and I should not focus on it. So these are the kinds of stuff. I mean, this was a very rudimentary example, but these are the kinds of stuff that analytics tells you that where your problem lies, we need to understand how to ask the right question and hence get the right answer. So that's what we have, um, you know, from uh, the prediction bit. Now, where else does prediction? In a corporate, there are so many processes, systems, so many things that happen, right? I'm sure you would have done your internships, you would have got some idea. So where do we have a need for prediction in corporate? Any idea? Which work process might need prediction? Feel free to respond, please. One of the things that we always look for uh, when we go for lectures in management institutions is let's see how smart the people are. And smartness is not always about the intelligent answers or things like that. It's about you know you seizing the opportunity to share a thought in front of multiple people. And we tend to think that what if I give a very stupid answer, but there's nothing called stupid answer or wrong answer. It's all about making an attempt. Go ahead, try. Okay, I'll give you some more time, but do come back and speak. Yeah, you must try that. So it's, it's, it's happening here in the auditorium, but tomorrow you all will be in a room like this, in a place like this, where you have taken your first step in corporate and there will be people coming in, doing induction for you. How do you make a mark out of so many people? You have to master that art of speaking out. I know there are always butterflies in the tummy when we speak out, happens to me also, and it's perfectly applicable, acceptable, but do learn to speak out. So when it comes to better prediction models, so one of the areas, I thought an HR person might answer this. One of the areas where prediction helps a lot is attrition. So wouldn't it be wonderful to see the kind of effort that organizations and HR takes to actually screen CVs, put up advertisements, and go through the entire process of selection and onboarding somebody. So in a setup like this, when you have a, when you have a tool which tells you that, or, or let's say when a tool tells me that Rima, your attrition figures have been like this. You have lost maximum people who have joined the organization and been here for three to five months, which we call as infantile attrition. You know, that's the name. So infantile attrition has been quite a lot. Or you have lost a lot of people who seem to have come from a particular background. Or you have lost a lot of people who have kind of spent five years with the company. So these are the prediction models that we get. We get it for attrition. We get it for business. Imagine you are with a travel and hospitality uh, enterprise, right? You would be having hotel bookings and all of that. So lots of people do lots of hotel bookings. Which are the ones which actually turn into reality. And then we cancel also quite a lot, right? So booking happens, cancellation happens. 
But if you put a tool, AI tool there, you will understand that which are the seasons which have a high booking uh, possibility and the ones which actually materialize. So that's an example of prediction in this sector. Any of you from media sector, as in uh, uh, people who have worked with TAM ratings, how based on serial performance and all things change. Now, so let me give an example here. So I used to work for a media company and uh, uh, we would be having, uh, actually I can name here, it's there on my profile also. So I was with Sony Pictures and we have brought some very plum properties to the nation. Properties like uh, uh, IPL, that was the biggest one, followed by Gondwaninga Karopati. Then there were some uh, serials like Varian Chalante and, uh, you know, quite a lot of these. Now, the fate of media companies changes every week. The report card comes out every week. Because there's the software called TAM, which publishes the ratings of the shows that we put up on screen. So when we do that, you know, when this when these ratings fluctuate with time, how can prediction models help? So prediction models can tell us that this is the kind of show or a particular show at a particular time slot seems to work well. For example, if it is a mature life uh, love story. There are chances of this serial clicking if the time slot is 9.30. Why? People who are in that mature age bracket would be home from their office and, you know, other jobs, maybe household, kitchen. Things would be done by that time and they would be sitting in front of TV and enjoying the show. But if you have something like that at 5.30 p.m., it will not work. So prediction models are applicable in various industries and in any industry for multiple processes. So I spoke about attrition in HR. There are so many other things. Like some time back, there was a news about the uh, group. So now, of course, a lot of companies are doing that. They had put up something which was an emotion meter. It will be some other IT company also. Emotion meter, which meant that when you are entering the organization, there is biometric and you are there and your mood is actually getting reflected on the software. And that information is reaching HR to say that you are coming into office as happy, joyful, a little sad, a little worried, a little disengaged. So how is this information important for each of multiple ways? Right? One is it tells me on a given day, what could be my percentage of engaged employees? It can also tell me that are there some specific periods when the board seems to go a bit up and down? For example, in festive period, when everybody is, let's say, celebrating Christmas and there are so many employees who have come to office and you see that their boards are not particularly joyful. It tells you something, right? So that's the emotion analysis that happens by the tool to tell you that in times of festivities, you may not have the uh, maximum engagement coming in from employees. Workflow automation. Have you heard this phrase? So this is about uh, leading process in an organization. There are process flows, there are workflows, right? Uh, let me talk about again recruitment, something that most of you are familiar with. So in recruitment, we do scheduling of interviews, right? Multiple scheduling. So uh, these tools can make that scheduling easy. Meeting scheduling, interview scheduling. Uh, in fact, in a recent conference where I was speaking, so the speaker before me was, I think, somebody from Price of the House, and he was putting it up on screen the power of uh, these tools and the example that he was showing is a very common example actually that if I ask my calendar all of us people like me are heavily dependent on our calendars the first thing that we do in the morning is check our calendars then what are my things to do during the day because that way we can devote uh, the right amount of time to the right activity so if I ask the question to my calendar then tell me in 2024 how many of my Mondays have free slots in them? Absolutely. How many of my Mondays are free? Which means on that Monday, there is no meeting slot. Now, it might sound a little 
uh, weird, but we live in live such busy lives that already next six months of my 2024 has multiple things blocked in the calendar. Now, if I if suddenly there is a wedding in the family, something is finalized, and I have to take time out for that activity. What do I do? I have to scan my calendar and check where I have a free time so that I can put that personal activity in there. So, workflow automation is another area. What do we mean by personalization? <laughs> so, this is a term which we are kind of very familiar with these days because um, not all our lives are same, right? So, there are times, I mean, somebody would like more salt in the food, somebody would like it more sugary, and, uh, you know, the taste varies and the palate changes, all these things happen. So, how can we expect that the learning patterns will really be the same? It isn't. So, the way I learn could be different from how you learn. Some of the things I struggle a lot uh, to figure out the geographical location of a place. I struggle big time. While reading maps. Can't help. But then there could be someone who does this very well. I'll do a great job of multitasking, though. I can juggle multiple things at the same time. So we all have our individual strengths and uh, improvement areas, if, if you will. And uh, personalization helps if there are different learning forms designed for different people. E learning, you are aware, you're aware of? So just like this is one form of learning that is happening when I'm talking to you and possibly after the lecture, certain things will stay in your mind. If two, three, these things stay in your mind, my job is done, you know. Similarly from e-learning, so many people derive a lot of learnings because they could be like, I cannot be sitting in one place in a classroom and going through learning. I will do it at my pace, at my convenience on the computer. So, AI does a very good job of personalization of learning as well. Next. So, I do have a feeling that probably this uh, lecture would have been more suitable if uh, you would have had some understanding about the other functions like and, 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 uh, and things, etc. However, I must also tell you that. Uh, it's always good to start in the beginning. When you have still not got exposed to the theoretical aspects of things, and I'm telling you actually what's happening in the industry, that's also a great form of learning. Because you could be going in for life projects somewhere, you could be going in for your internships, you can use some of this knowledge. So, the common HR uses of AI. Have you heard of chatbot? Have you experienced a chatbot? You have, right? So, have you seen to a great extent chatbot is able to solve our queries and then there would be that moment of frustration when you're asking some question and it's just not getting it. That will also happen. And then you feel that give me my good old executive who would answer the phone and I can talk about my queries. It happens, right? So, which, which also reinforces the need that uh, it's not about only AI or data, it's about the two meeting. So chatbots are common. Now in corporate again, let me give you an example. So all of you, when you pass out, not that all of you will be in Calcutta working for the same company. Not possible, right? Or hardly possible. So you would be with different organizations in different geographies, probably, with different kinds of shift schedules. Right. Some of you might have Saturday Sunday as holiday. Some of you might have your weekly offs on, let's say, on Monday and Thursday. Anything is possible. Now, in a setup like this, how does a chatbot help in enhancing employee experience? So, if you want to know how many uh, holidays you have, how many leaves you have pending during the year, one option, of course, for your HR. But there could be a possibility that your HR has moved on to high-end stuff by then and is referring you to the chatbot that is a regular common query. Ask the chatbot, it will respond. Very much possible. Now imagine you are working, if you are working in Dubai, you're in all likelihood your uh, weekly off 
would be on a Friday, but your Sunday is working. But if I ask that question sitting in Mumbai in a different company, probability my next stops are on Saturday, Sunday. So when these kinds of things happen, and when a chatbot is still able to share the right data, that means that there is a artificial intelligence tool in the backend. Because, and that is happening because of the personalization of data. Chatbot has all the data about me, which is related to my workplace, my shift schedules, my holiday routine, my leaves logged in the system, all of that, right? So when it comes to these things and the chatbot has an idea and it gives out data differently to different people, just imagine the kind of efficiency enhancement that happens, right? Because you don't have to flip through those pages of policy manuals. I don't know if you have seen it during your internships, but we have seen these packed policy manuals which talk about all the leaves and rules and everything in the company, right? So instead of flipping through all of these, we now have an executive who's answering this question. Only the executive is not a human being. It's a chatbot. So there are lots of recommendations that uh, we can get from AI. So are you aware of something called appraisal process? I can see some nodding heads. So appraisal process where overall a manager gives uh, shares, inputs, and insights to the employee as to how he or she has done throughout the year. Right? right. In the same discussion, there is also a focus discussion around skills. That let's say I have not done so well in the area of, let's say, uh, negotiations. I was negotiating with some, with some vendors, but my manager has seen that that's not my best possible skill. Now, if I am in that role, if I am, let's say, a purchase executive in an organization, I need to have good negotiation skills, right? So, in that case, we have to figure out um, the which are those training programs which will help me in enhancing that skill. And how do I get to know about that? If there is a chatbot, if there is an AI tool, again, it will pull out the data from the appraisal sheet and tell me that these are the top three things where your boss told you that you can. It could be negotiation skills, it could be influencing skills, it could be MS Excel. And if that input is shared with me, what do I do with that? I go to training team and I try to figure out when do training programs happen in these areas. And again, if my AI tool is active, it will throw up that information from the training calendar and tell me that the next workshop on negotiation skills is happening and so on so on. So that's how it completes the entire loop and recruitment we have already spoken about. Thanks. So this is specifically for recruitment and um, given the fact that majority of uh, students sitting here are from first year, I'm not getting into too much of detail unless you have those specific questions for me. But in recruitment, there could be lots of uh, areas. One particular area which is very helpful for the business is improving recruiter efficiency. So the question that we ask to recruiters is, how many people have you onboarded in a single month? And onboarding is different from recruitment because in this case, we are also trying to check that finally how many people came up. Because uh, we also have cases where Monday morning time for people to join and candidate gives us a call to say that, you know, I am unwell, somebody is unwell, I am not able to join. While we all know what the real reason is, there must be another better offer in the pocket. So that's such a common thing. Um, you will experience it a lot when you are on the other side of the table. And I just hope you don't let someone suffer because of this, because sometimes we make commitments to clients that then people are joining on a Monday and then when people don't show up, it's a matter of integrity. And integrity is not always about uh, stealing something or lying or things like that. It's about keeping a promise. When you make a promise to somebody, Keep that promise. If you can't keep that promise, inform people beforehand about your inability 
to do so. So, uh, recruiter efficiency, how many people someone has been able to put on board, all these uh, detailed and complex data analysis can be done very well by AI. So, HR consulting, again, do you roughly know what consultants do? Yeah, what do they do? Perfect. So they collect data, they analyze data, then they give solutions and recommendations. And I'm sure a lot of you would be working for consulting organizations in future. So when it comes to these kinds of uh, uh, consulting areas, of course, there's an immense uh, opportunity. So something that I mentioned about uh, the performance management parts, you know, the appraisal data and all of them it comes out. So consultants work with a lot of data. And uh, there was a time when all of those had to be checked manually. Those times are gone. Now tools can help them. When it comes to voice of employees, right? How do people get to know what is the pulse of an organization? Because there could be people who are uh, probably very unhappy about a particular area or some people who are clueless about which direction the company is going to. So if AI is able to analyze the voice of employees, that really, really helps. And of course, you know, there are some general knowledge also which we possess, which is consultants will come and talk to us and finally tell us what we already know. So those are the general stuff. But um, yes, it helps a lot in the HR consulting areas. The next one. So l &D, again, I have mentioned how l &D is able to uh, sort out data and match the requirements to the actual event, which is uh, of, of importance to people. It's just that l &D coaching, these are not areas which are so well explored right now. Right now, there is a lot of work that is going on in this area, and you will see that the adoption is not only so fast. There is a little bit of issue with adoption at the moment because uh, companies look at ROI. What's ROI? Okay. Right now, the response is from Full House. Return on investment, right? It's very difficult for us to show an immediate ROI. So, the analytics part I was talking about, right? Probably that will help analytics with the AI uh, uh, engine will help a lot in terms of, you know, better prediction and so many other things. But how that better prediction has helped in business, it takes a while to understand that. And, and in business, as you always know, there's always a fierce battle which is going on to increase margins to have the PNL lines healthy. And that's where we have a bit of struggle. But I can tell you one thing, an investment in analytics can be of great uh, help to organizations if they invest in that area. Lots of companies are doing it because getting to know the emotion, sentiment, voice of employees, these are things which help you in your HR strategy or public strategy for that matter. Which area you should be focusing on that comes from the different surveys that you do internally, right? So all of these are the common areas in AI. In HR, however, you can see that the adoption is still in early stages. Let's skip a bit. I think time-wise also, uh, we have to leave some room for Q&A. Uh, next. This is what I was referring to, that the emotion analysis or the sentiment analysis tells us that what percentage of people are engaged or not engaged. Now, if people are not engaged, is that a good thing? Not really, right? But if people are not engaged and they continue to be with the company, is that a good thing? That is worse, right? So that's where this data is of great importance. You know, again, you know, do I need to take some special measures or initiatives which can actually help increase my engagement levels? So the surveys and different interventions actually help in this area. Yeah, next one. Next slide, please. 
So these are some of those. Uh, basically, these are very discussion dependent uh, slides. But since I understand that you are not fully exposed to this area, I'll move a bit past here. So this is the point that I was talking about that when placed in unhappy circumstances, people become unproductive. So as a company, am I placing my people in unhappy circumstances? That's what I have to figure out. So all those examples that I was giving, right? Or maybe, have you seen a recent debate which uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy started? I'm sure not deliberately, but somehow we triggered that. What was that? 70 hours work week. Who thinks that's a brilliant idea? Anyone thinks? Actually, perhaps it's, it's, a, it's been uh, blown a bit out of context. The idea for it was to communicate a message to youngsters that it's very important to stay focused at your work and when you are a developing nation, then of course, I mean, I know that we know that in uh, uh, these years of independence, we have taken very, very good strides, confident strides as a nation. But still, there is so much more that we can do, right, to be the superpower, economic superpower in the world. And which automatically means that there's a lot of hard work involved, right? But the 70 years work we kind of got a bit uh, blown out of context. But it's a fact that if these are the norms that you set for employees, that you have to work for 70 hours a week, perhaps it will not work. I don't know the answer. Again, when you do these AI-induced sentiment analysis in the organization, you will know that have people taken it as a positive step and they're very happy to do it, or it has made people unhappy, which has in turn led to a dip in productivity. Next, please. Next. This is the climate survey I was talking about. So every employee actually looks forward to, of course, we don't like filling up the forms, even uh, at a restaurant, after uh, we have had our meal, when the feedback, feedback form comes up, do we feel very happy? Oh, now I have to, you know, put my feedback there. No, we try to pass it on to the next person who can fill it up for us. But basically, in, in organizations, uh, employees do look for those outlets where they can share their feedback. And that's where all these surveys help us. And all the survey engines are backed up by automation and to a great extent AI. So we have our own products, which is TrueWatch, TrueCam. These are all in the areas of intelligent automation, intelligent data capture, and they have made lives so much simple. So maybe someday when uh, I have a bigger group which has kind of learned the basics of the function is here, we can talk about those. Next. The different engagement drivers in an organization. So if you think, I might have tools handy, AI and automation and other tools, but where do I use them? These are the different areas where you can use the tools. Even if you have to know how healthy is your organization, a simple thing, how will you know? Almost every company has a practice of executive health checkups. The reports come mostly not to the company. You know, we all try to be very predictive about that data, so it's between the employee and the hospital. But it's possible for us to find out from analytics and AI tools that is in a majority of my employee population which is affected by some heart ailment, right? I don't need to see individual reports. I'll never see that because that's breach of confidentiality. You also, as uh, I mean, all of you who are HR professionals, never ask for personal uh, data for people. But you still need to know what's going on in your organization and strategize accordingly. That's where these mass tools are of use. Next. 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 So I'm, I'm kind of flipping through it because these are all a little more in-depth design-related elements, which maybe we could cover some other day. Next. So I will come to this slide. So now I have moved on. From the areas in HR where you can use AI to examples of use of AI in different industries. Anyone is interested to work for a bank in future? Some of you are, right? 
for the bank, what is of utmost importance? What is the biggest business driver? Loans, interest, these are the products of the banks. But what drives business for the bank? Somebody say customer. So with customer, I'll add another word. Customer experience. I could be buying, I could be taking loans, I could be taking, uh, you know, uh, some other product of a retail bank, but it's all about my experience. Meaning when I go somewhere, as they say in general, you may forget what someone has done for you. Memory doesn't support always, especially with things. But you do not forget how someone made you feel. So, same goes for, you know, just like it's a life experience tenet that I shared with you today. And then check this out, you know, check out from your childhood experience, experiences with friends. If someone made you feel great or if someone made you feel very bad, you will never forget these two extremes of experience. So, what a bank, you know, did I have to go through a whole lot of uh, churn and whole lot of steps and unnecessary uh, activities to get to my coveted home loan or car loan stage, that means quite a lot. Because if that is there, the next time I'll not go to the same bank. Or my next time, we live in an extremely agile world today, right? I have a negative experience with one bank, you may really have my loan to the other bank. And hence the customer experience part. So, what is this uh, email analytics all about? So, there are thousands of email requests, right, which come to a bank. So, our AI tool has been able to draw out email analytics and figure out those areas where the bank needs to focus on. So, this is one example of AI being helpful to enhance the customer experience because what hurts us the most? As it happened with you, you sent a message to somebody and you're eagerly waiting for that revert and it just doesn't come or it comes after a long long wait how does that make you feel very irritated especially if you have uh, sent it not for time pass purposes but for something which was really critical for you you feel very bad right so when a tool is able to do these for banks and is able to figure out the essence of those email requests it's again of great help now, coming back to the topic which the, the, the line that the Institute had given me, that can AI replace humans? And all this while, the message I'm trying to pass on is it's not about AI only or human intelligence only. It's about a mix of both. And one having a control over another to take the output to a desired level. You remember, uh, or, or you all were perhaps not even born that time. So there was a time when computer came in, right? And before that, it used to be, you know, I mean, uh, people keeping books and typewriters, all those things. Do you know the kind of um, agitation that happened in India? Agitation, protests, organized protests. Because they say this one machine called computer is going to take away my job and I can't afford to do that. So why is government doing all this? So that was the time. From there, we have come till here. So, at every phases, we have the doubt in mind that is this new technology advent going to take away my jobs? But jobs don't go. Rather, new jobs get created. You have to keep this in mind that AI is a friend and not foe. And anyways, all the business predictions are saying that companies which are not using AI will be extinct over a period of time. Think about a simple example. The reason why I put up this email request thing is this is a regular issue that we face, right? We all try to go to banks with our queries and we get responses either immediately or later. And depending on that, we choose whether to continue to do business with that bank or not, right? So this was our such example. And um, the way uh, evolution has happened, you know, um, the movie, A Space Odyssey, and uh, the super uh, computer had, you know, that time it was a huge thing that how can a computer be an antagonist? And after that, we moved on, IBM brought up Watson, part of Watson, 
So that was IBM's deep QA project. And um, now, of course, we have all kinds of uh, support coming in from these machines, so to say. So, and the results also, you can see the use of AI, what it has brought about, auto-analysis, auto-routing of emails, prioritization, and speed of processing of emails, right? So speed, pace, we don't have time these days. You know, I mean, we never had time in the past also. This is why two minutes rules got invented, but now we don't probably want to wait for two minutes also probably for something. And this is where these tools help. Now, there are some jobs which certainly would be a threat. Without those jobs, jobs which involve road learning or jobs which are really routine and very really administrative. So a simple example. So sometime back, there was a discussion going on about a developmental aspect of the company. And there was one person who was the scribe. You know what a scribe does? Scribe typically writes down everything that's going on and kind of puts it together and puts it as minutes of the meeting. So someone made a mention, uh, you know, the moment the scribe was introduced, so all of us will discuss this, and uh, Mr. X is the scribe for us. One of the team members in that meeting made a comment. So, Mr. Scribe, your job is just now gone because now um, the tools do it for us. Microsoft Teams has the recording aspect. So, recording is one part where you have the entire thing recorded, but when you want to uh, take out or extract the important parts of it, then your AI tool comes into the picture, right? So, this is how times are changing. So I think we are just seven minutes away. Maybe I'll take one more example. Next. So this is complete contract management for a large company. Have you ever seen large contracts? Maybe a legal contract or something that just goes into places. You know, so there are so many professionals have these contracts, right? And in any organization, you will certainly see it when you start working full time. And then we get to see that, uh, you know, for any individual to read those, of course, people have been reading thousands of pages also, making notes and um, recycling some meaning out of it. But when a machine does it for you, try us chat GPT. You know, take a 40 pages report, maybe some Mercer report, KPMG report, whatever it is, you know, some kind of an industry report, and then ask that question. Then can you summarize this for me in, let's say, 10 bullet points? You'll actually get an answer. And just imagine the kind of uh, processing work that goes into the background and the kind of time it saves for you. So this is one example and where it's used. So one is I said, contracts are there applicable for every organization and in almost every process. You will find some contract. But there are uh, legal firms which use this a lot. And they have started uh, using AI big time. And companies like ours were also trying to uh, let people know, you know. So recently, have you seen the pattern of uh, heartbeats? You know? So how the ECG can be interpreted and the patterns of ECG can actually be used to forecast the presence of a disease or possibility of a disease. You've read about that. So these are things which are coming up with a very rapid pace. So I would urge you uh, one thing certainly that should be the habit of reading newspapers and if the newspaper is too archaic for you and not really something of your generation, then use your mobile. There's, there's news available from every source. Do know what's happening in the industry. So always ensure that you're kind of up to date with what's going on. Stay relevant, read a lot, uh, discuss and deliberate amongst yourselves about the trends, and don't be shy and afraid of speaking up ever. You know, the more you do it, the more confident you become. So I will stop here. Any questions? So I think the question that was sent to me yesterday, I kind of covered it in this last uh, hour. But still, is there something which you want to know from me?
एरियाज then this is uh, then this fear is absolutely um, baseless clearly uh, but society is still thinking about it because if you look at overall society's outlook towards skill upgradation it's not a very agile outlook because it takes a while even a simple thing right it, it's so easy for us to pick up a pastry from a shop is it so easy for us to go to the gym and start working out even if we know that it's important so the moment it comes to doing something to yourself in a positive way which involves a kind of a discipline there is always a bit of hesitation initially right so skill upgradation is the way forward is what i would say stay away from administrative tasks a lot of those tasks well enough to be able to guide someone who's writing the algorithm to fix that problem but There is absolutely no fear of job scoring, but but you must be mindful of administrative tasks. And if you are in your own jobs, whatever you are doing, when you join corporates, if you are constantly able to show your supervisors, your department heads that these are the areas where automation is possible, you will be seen as someone who is different from the rest. Try to create that unique space for yourself. You know, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you ended with uh, creating a unique space for every individual. So I'm sorry, I was not present. Perhaps this question was answered earlier also. But this question that is there on the screen: Can AI replace humans? Now, if we reformulate this question in a different way and say that what Therefore, is the meaning of being human. So, if a large part of activity that human beings can do can also be done by AI, so therefore, what remains for the human human beings to be done? And therefore, if we ask this question, what is the meaning of being human in the world of AI? How would you look at this question? Very interesting. So, I I feel that there is one thing which uh probably no ai can replace and that's the emotional intelligence part because as human beings we possess that superlative ability to perceive to collaborate to be with people to understand the nuances of relationships and corporate dynamics right there is no book that has been discovered where you mug it up and you know that this is the a uh, recipe for success i have bought it up and hence i know i'm going to be successful that's not the case so the unique ability to kind of absorb and assimilate and apply emotional intelligence is this device it might be say that you know uh, possibly uh, aptitude and and uh, intellectual intelligence is kind of uh, much much overrated but that's what we have been uh, Right, that uh, attitude is the most important thing. But let me tell you, there are so many people who have actually failed in life because they have not been able to combine their intellectual intelligence with emotional intelligence. You know, so they say that with every transaction, every transaction is like a, a bank record. So there is a constant debit and credit that is going on. You are hurtful to people. if you are not true to the relationship so there is a negative uh, that is there in the balance sheet you do something good for others there is a plus that comes in so this is not a dynamics which is for a robot or automation to understand 
in corporates you will face lots of instances where it's about handling employee grievances you certainly cannot you know put there i was talking about sophia initially you cannot put sophia in charge of handling grievances in an organization it, it these are real problems which need real application of the might you know and which which develops because we are we are born and then brought up and conditioned in a certain way which helps us to understand the societal norms right so i would say that you know emotional intelligence is the area where we will always have human supremacy and for the students i would say learn more about coaching learn the benefit of being mentored because these are all additional supplements and reinforcements of learning that come your way whenever institute organizes these things be a part of it sometimes you know you will understand the merit of it sometimes you may not but uh, make yourself at home with the flow yes Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Pooja Kumari. Uh, I just have one question: that what do developers should ensure that AI should operate ethically? Okay, how do developers ensure that AI should operate ethically? So, like I mentioned initially, um, so developers typically you would find them in IT setups, right? Uh, it's a must for every IT organization to publish these rules and frameworks. to all those who are writing codes now to say one thing that um we have algorithms which which actually uh, you know are there behind the codes but who writes algorithms it is human beings with their own biases etc so there are times when bias of a developer can creep into the algorithm as well that's where continuous learning and sensitization that helps and that's what companies have started doing i know there will still be some ups and downs we have gdpr issues we have data privacy related issues coming up and yet experimentation in ai will also not stop but it's important that we learn about that and like i mentioned these frameworks are available yeah okay good afternoon Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Kanjma. So I just want to know how do we protect AI from hackers? How do we protect AI from hackers? Well, complete protection from hackers is something which is probably a bit of an utopia because nobody has been able to achieve that. So I think companies need to take those security measures and follow those protocols. In my organization, ISMS is a norm. for life you know isms is uh, information security management system so there are so many emails you know it there could be chances that i need a random acquaintance and someone sends that mail to me that mail will not reach me because it will get stuck at company firewalls so there are lots of such measures at a very basic level which are there but then in the uh, you know world wide web there are so many possibilities so many sources from where hacking can be done and with these threats i think we will always be exposed to so you have all of rats of where it is right so that happened that has happened with these companies as well you know attack happens and then there is ransom and there is so much of data stake especially when it comes to customer data of financial institutions and you become a bit helpless so continuous awareness about this and people who are policy makers in organizations they have to keep coming up with these workshops to sensitize people you know so in my organization we try to do it in a gamified way we wanted people to go through these mandatory compliance courses on information security and we saw that adoption was a little low initially so we just turned it into a you know game uh, all together saying that these are the different functions which are completing let's see where we have maximum qualified people in isms we ran contests competitions we socialized the names of all the winners of those uh, uh, courses and competitions across the organization these are some of the things that you can do and at a very top level the organizations must invest in the softwares which actually protect our uh, data yes So, uh, so uh, 
Not really, you know. I mean, not that this scenario is technically impossible. Technically, it does sound possible. But for us to get to that level, it would mean that adoption of AI is widespread. It has kind of, you know, pervaded areas which we had not thought of. And what you are talking about, you know, uh, uh, where we, like there have been times, right, where we have lost audience because we had stopped using them. But uh, here we are talking about the brain. And like I mentioned, we are constantly in that information assimilation stage. So, Utilization of the brain will stop.